So about a year and a half ago, I wrote this blog. It was a third part of a four part series on goal setting. It was about how to get leverage on your goals and the type of leverage that'll push you through the hard times and help you to continue to pursue your goals. I'm re-recording the video for that tonight uh, because I had an epiphany tonight. I'm in a martial art called Krav Maga. I just finished my workout. As you can see, I'm still sweating up a storm, but I wanted to get this video recorded because this information hit me hard tonight when I was in training. I wanted to get it out there before I really let the, the, the emotion go on. So but to explain what this is about leverage and how it's going to affect your goal setting, I've got to tell you a little bit about what Krav Maga is. And for those of you that don't know, Krav Maga is the self-defense system of the Israeli Special Forces. Now, I've been around martial arts most of my life. I grew up in it uh, with Potoka Khan up in Shelton, Washington, which is a tournament fighting style. Taught Kempo for a while. I was in Muay Thai at the lab, training for the UFC, things along those lines. So I've done, and I wasn't in the UFC, but they trained for the UFC. So I've done a lot of different martial arts, but Krav is unique from the standpoint that it's based on how to survive in the street. If somebody comes up and sticks a gun to your head, what do you do to survive and go home to your family? You know, same thing for a knife or stick or whatever. It's what do you do to survive and be able to go home? That's what the whole system is based on. It's no rules, no holds barred, it's just surviving. So it's a cool system in that way. And a normal class night on, at Krav kind of goes like this. We do about a, a five minute high intensity cardio warm up, then we do a five minute stretch routine, then we'll do about 10 minutes of pad work, throwing combos to focus mitts, just keeping our striking crisp. And then we'll get into a technique. We may be working bear hugs, chokes, knife defense, gun defense, stick defense, somebody just throwing a punch at you, whatever defenses, some ground defenses. Um, but whatever it is they're focusing on that night, and we'll break it down by the numbers. What do you do step by step by step? And once we get that down, we'll go to doing the whole process fluid but slow. And I'm getting close to the point here. And then in about the last 10 minutes of class, we put it into a real world high intensity situation where they may be having us throw punches on pads or doing burpees, something to stress our system to make us tired. And then at any moment, and we don't know when, one of the other students is going to come up and attack us with what we've been working on. Now, say it's bear hugs. They may come do a bear hug from behind, from the side, from the front, over the arms, under the arms, under one arm trapping the other arm. And we have to be able to do the defense we learned when we weren't expecting it, when we didn't know which one was coming, and when we're tired from doing you know, the other process. So it puts it into a really real world situation. We can do that for five, 10 minutes until you're just flat out exhausted. You're barely able to lift your arms and you're still having to go. And about that time when your body's hitting that fatigue level, when you're wanting to stop, the instructors are walking around the room and they're saying something like this, finish the fight, finish the fight. If you're still breathing, you're fighting, right? And that's the whole concept. You can't stop in a street fight. You don't get the luxury of a five minute rest period between rounds or a break if you get kicked in the groin the way they do in cage fighting, you have to finish the fight. You know, one time I actually, we were doing a knife defense and in this particular scenario, I was, my wife was with me, you know, theoretically, and I had to defend her as well. And I screwed up the defense. I had my arm position wrong and it slipped past my, my guard and would have stabbed me. And the instructor actually said, you can bleed out and die later, finish the fight right now so you gotta get your wife out alive. Right? And that's the mentality, whatever it takes. And here's the epiphany I had during that process. Because what they're really doing is they're getting leverage on us to push us. When we're tired and we don't want to go any further, they make us think about getting home alive. They make us think about protecting our family. And that provides enough leverage for us to push through the pain, to push through the fatigue, and to continue the fight. What if me and you approach goal setting with that same level of intensity, that same level of do or die attitude, finish the fight, if we're still breathing, we're fighting, no matter what? What would that do to our ability to set and achieve goals? And then as I was driving home after the class, I started thinking, why don't we do that? And here's what I came up with. I'm going to draw a little chart for you. But what I came up with is, I think number one is we set wussy goals. And let me explain to you what I mean by that, okay? Let's say this is a happiness line, right? This is our happiness line. And down here, we have zero. Zero sucks, that's miserable. It could not get any worse. Any one, two, three, four, 
5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 10 is utopia. You couldn't be happier if you dreamt it. Nothing could be better. You're living the dream. Everything is awesome, right? Most people live right about here in the four to six range, right? Anthony Robbins refers to this as no man's land. And the reason is, is because you're not happy. You're just blah. It just okay. Somebody asks you, hey, how's your day going? Eh, you know, it's, it's all right, not too bad, not too bad, right? But it, it, it's nothing to write home about. But at the same time, you're not in a bad enough place to want to change it. And the reason why is whenever we set a goal, the goal is really a change. We're trying to get something better. And to do that, we have to change. And with most change comes a level of pain. And if you're not experiencing pain here, and you have a goal that's not very motivating over here, you're not going to be willing to get out of the status quo and create pain, i.e. change, to be able to pursue a loftier goal. But why is it when people hit rock bottom, they tend to make changes? I mean, when you end up down here, like say you're right here at a one, which is probably about where I was two years ago when we lost our house and filed bankruptcy, almost lost my business when the economy crashed in 08. I was way down in the dump. But the reason people create change there is because there's so much pain over here that the pain involved in creating change is actually less pain than what you're experiencing day to day anyway, so that ability to push through and create change becomes easier because you're getting out of pain. And here's a sad truth, but it's been proven by sociologists, we will do more to get out of pain than we will to gain pleasure. So what'll happen is we get down here and we're miserable and it's like, no matter what, I can't live like this anymore. I'm gonna make a change. And we make a change and we start getting better and we start bouncing up to being happier and happier. And then what happens? We get here into no man's land and we're happier. We're not happy, we're happier, we're not miserable anymore. And now all of a sudden, continuing the process of pushing forward to our goals without that pain associated over here, and we tend to slow down because we're not as miserable anymore. So we, we want to take a break. And this is where most goals plateau. Now if you're starting here, it's really hard to ever start the change because there's not enough pain to initiate it. So how do we get from here and push through the no man's land, or if we're starting right here, to go ahead and get over into 7, 8, 9, and 10, where you can truly start experiencing happiness and joy, and what we all want in life, but what most of us aren't willing to actually go get, because we won't get into the pain to create the change. What does it take to get over here? How do you get that finish the fight mentality, if I'm still breathing, I'm fighting, and I'm going all the way to here? Well, the way you do it is you create such a compelling goal over here, that not having the goal actually creates as much pain as over here living the life you're living. Now the problem is most people will set goals like this. I would like a new car. Now they already have a car. It gets them from point A to point B, but they want a nicer car. But you know what? For most people, a nicer car when you already have a car is a goal, but it's not a do or die goal. It's not something you're gonna be willing to get into pain to achieve. Or if they want to make a fitness change, so they'll set a goal like, I want to see my ab, or I want to get into size 32s. You know, but again, there's not, and for most people, and some people, are, this may create enough pain, but not having that typically doesn't create enough pain to push you out of no man's land to go pursue that. So how do you do it? Well, you find a primary goal that's big enough that not having this is going to get, get you into pain. Like for instance, and this is going to be different for everybody. For me, because during the recession, you know, we, we lost our house and we, we lost our savings account and everything like that. And I, I've got twin daughters who are 17 and me and my wife are in our early 40s. And I got to think about things like paying for college and weddings and, and paying for retirement. And you know, that's kind of my duty as husband and father. And I don't have the ability to do that just yet, although I'm on the right track again, finally. But that was one of the pain things for me, because not being able to do that, not being able to live up to my standard as a father and a husband and do the job that I feel I have to do, that creates enough pain for me 
to make a change even when I'm not, when I'm over here in no man's land. The pain of not being able to do that is powerful enough. And you know what? Here's the cool thing. I would like a new car too. Now a new car isn't a driving enough force to get me over here, but if I'm looking at from this aspect that I've got to become financially free because I have to be able to take care of my kids and I have to be able to pay for retirement, the car becomes a strategic byproduct. I want you to learn that term, strategic byproduct, of achieving the loftier goal, of achieving the goal that actually creates pain and compels action. Now, if you're trying to get in shape, getting a six-pack or getting into 32s aren't a bad goal, but find something else that's going to create pain. If you have diabetes that runs in your family, or you have heart disease that runs in your family, or you've had family that have unfortunately have died early due to degenerative diseases because they were unhealthy, that can be a pain to drive you forward because you don't want to repeat that because you want to be there when your kids graduate school, when your kids have kids, you want to see your grandkids. That can create enough pain for you to get healthy. And then the getting into 32s and getting the six pack just becomes a strategic byproduct of the larger goal that will actually be motivating enough to push you forward to achieve it. So that's all of what getting leverage is, is getting enough leverage about the future result that you want that is going to push you from where you are now to where you want to go. If you have any comments on that, comment down below. I'd love to hear what you think about it.